Thank you. Um, welcome to the Farmers Forum sessions for Saturday. I'm Patrick Byers, Regional Horticulture Specialist with the University of Missouri Extension. This is being taped. That's why we're doing this over again. And I want to welcome you to the sessions. Our first speaker is John Nenninger, and he will be talking about small hive beetle control in beehives. And uh, John, if you would please speak into the microphone. We're being taped. And later on, when we have question and answers, the microphone here would be very helpful if anyone who has a question comes up and uses that mic as far as uh, any questions. So with that, uh, let's welcome John. Thank you very much. I'm going to remove this thing because I like to walk around and talk. Um, my name is John Ninager, of course, and uh, I got this grant from Sarah. And if you have any questions, concerns, or comments, you can email them to that email address. That's not mine. The other two email addresses are for people who if you want to get more information about the SARE program, how you can uh, come up with an idea, grants, and uh, it's a good source of information. Okay. Quickly, we're going to just cover uh, the history of small hive beetles, some of its weaknesses. My original test proposal in 2011, which has changed slightly, yeah, test results from 2011. Uh, we're going to go over some of the costs related to that, how you can actually put your budget together, but that budget will change, uh, hopefully for the better. Then we came up with this question uh, at the end of last year. Could we control and or eliminate the small high beetle by non-chemical processes? And in, in, in thinking of that, uh, we were kind of like taking that biggest leap into uh, the unknown. Then we ended up, how can we re-verify or really test that our method was really a valid test? So that came up with 2012 tests. That's why it kind of lasted two years. Then we said, what is the weaknesses uh, in our own program, and what are th some of the upcoming products that were upcoming in the, uh, in the industry? Quickly, they came from Africa, 1998, uh, 14 years ago. Um, they lay three to seven eggs in a mass uh, uh, in cracks and crevices. And of course, they can lay from 100 to 1,000 masses in their lifetime. Uh, th she can, their life cycle is six months. So that means if you do the math roughly, that's 300 to 7,000 eggs that she can lay. That's the worst case scenario. Uh, there has been hives I've seen that are pretty close to this number. Okay, eggs hatch. These are now show and tell pictures. Oh. Um, how do you go back on this thing? Thank you. So if you, the egg will hatch in two to four days. And there's a picture of the egg. This is from the University of Florida. And that's what they look like after they hatch. This is actually a picture I took on a piece of pa uh, white paper on my kitchen counter. That blue line is actually a blue line off of your, uh, uh, like a normal writing pad. They like to feed on pollen and brew and honey. One thing I noticed that when I was trying to keep these things alive in my jar, uh, I actually dropped some honey on top of the larvae and it drowned. It actually dies in the honey. So if it gets actually smothered by honey, it will drown. They fully develop in 10 to 16 days, and that's what they look like fully developed. Uh, again, this is a picture I took on my kitchen counter, and I did have permission from my wife, and anybody wanted to know that. They need to uh, pupate in soil. That's, uh, and that's, uh, that's something that we need to concentrate on. And it'll take them 10 to 15 days to look like that. That's a picture I think another mother can only like. Um, I don't know what those little pins are for. I, I think it's probably to keep other things from eating them as they're developing. In their full life cycle, that's what they look like uh, once they've fully matured, their wings are underneath this 
armor plating in the back there. And when they fly, they almost look like, um, um, what do they call those little bugs? Uh, ladybugs. Uh, the wings are almost the same way. That's what they look like underneath. And it's really, you can see the hair. They look like they have a bunch of little hair around the outskirts of their body. This is a picture I took, and you know, I was interested in their feet. You can see that little claw thing and their little fuzzy feet. Again, you might be able to pick out this uh, hair. It seems to be, uh, you can only pick it up around on the edges, but it's actually the entire, their entire body's covered on it. Um, these feet are almost like feet of a bee. The bee will also have two kind of feet, you know, little claws and all, uh, little pads. They start laying eggs about seven days after they emerge, so they don't stay virgins long. They can have up to five generations per year. So think about that first bee, that first small hive beetle. She lays three to seven, then the next generation three to seven, and so forth and so on. And in, in, in no time, you can have a lot of small hive beetles. And of course, they can lay up to like 50 to 500 laying females in 67 days. That's a lot of laying eggs. And again, that's the worst case scenario. Some of the weaknesses. Get to know your enemy. That's what I decided when I went out and looked in my small high beetle. Uh, what is their weaknesses? Get to know the enemy. What is he or she not like? Well, humidity below 50%, temperature below 50. Last week, I went to one of my test locations, and it was like 40 degrees outside. I went out there to take a look at his hives, and he had about a eh, good 20 to 25 small high beetles on the outside of his hive. And he just told me earlier that morning he went in there to open up his hive and he uh, was taking out some honey. So he had uh, these small high beetles just laying around and he said they were dead. I said, no, nah, give me a jar. So he got me a little fruit jar, you know, maybe three inches. And I just scooped them up into the jar and put them in my car. And within two minutes, they were up and flying. I still have them at home and I actually have a picture of them. I was testing uh, something new with them. Uh, on there, so just because they look like they're dead and it's 40 degrees out, they're probably just hibernating. They're attracted to fluorescent lights. I tried something in my house. I have three hives at the front door. The UPS driver says is at my front door. I really don't think they are, but they they. Uh, I wanted to see if it really worked, so I went out and got a fluorescent light thing and I put it out there and I couldn't really tell, you know, if they were doing it or not. Uh, pheromones of beehives. I would love to. Uh, get to, to do that stuff, pheromone of adult bees, banana oil, cantaloupes, and native fruits. Pear is another one. My first small hive beetle was not in my beehive. It was on a retaining wall next to my garden where my cantaloupe were at. So they are out there. They will live. If they can't find that hive, they probably migrate to gardens and soft, what I call soft fruit. Uh, a weakness, lay eggs in cracks and crevices. A weakness is because that's where they want to go. What if we prevented that location? Maybe they won't be able to lay uh, eggs. Then, of course, the soil. They have to have that right kind of soil mix, and that was the key of my grant. How can we hold or contain or kill them, uh, the, the larvae? 2011, the test proposal was that I was going to buy these bees, five different varieties, and I did. I got five packages of each of these bees and at three locations. One was my own backyard, another one was a Crest Farm, and another location was what we call Dave's Farm, 40 acres. Uh, the uh, Dave's Farm never had bees on it. Mine was out in the middle of the woods, and Crest Farm had bees on their land about five years earlier, but they uh, left. We were also going to start testing uh, some of the stuff that the University of Florida came up with. And this is a nice little tube. It doesn't take that long to make. And um, uh, you just take a little PVC, cut it down to a foot in length, uh, number eight wire mesh, and then you put an attractor on the inside. That was our direction we were going to go in. Also out there in the market, or ideas on the website, you've got these plastic containers. You drill little holes put a little pheromone or some kind of a, a tractor in the middle, sitting in, uh, uh, floating in or submerged in or some way surrounded by some kind of oil. Uh, so as this, the beetles would go into these little holes, they'd actually fall into the oil and uh, drown. 
And then also the good old fashioned corrugated plastic strips. Um, uh, see uh, how can we could get those beetles to go in there and get stuck or get attracted to it. Uh, if they can go in here and let's say they use that to lay the eggs, how much time do we have from the moment we put this in to the moment we take it out that we're actually keeping the eggs from hatching? That was the uh, premise we were going to look into. Then, of course, the good old-fashioned screen bottom board with beetle traps. Uh, trapping agents, of course, we're going to start looking at a bunch of jellies, different uh, uh, grease, vegetable oils, and glues, uh, trying to keep it all natural without having to go into any kind of chemical. And the, but the main part of the presentation or the, uh, the test was this, what we call this uh, box stand. And it was the hive was going to be uh, uh, suspended over this rocky kind of uh, salty solution. And it was going to be placed on 30-pound felt paper. And it was going to be filled up with pea rock and salt. Because if we knew that, that the larvae has to get into that ground, we're going to try to get a barrier between it and the ground and put it in an, in an, into an environment that will kill the larvae. So this is a little test box in front of my house. This is a two by uh, six here. Uh, here's the felt paper. Here's a little pea rock we were using. Then we just put a bunch of salt on top. So, uh, and uh, that was the, uh, uh, the start of that test. Now, oop. With the, uh, with the, when we decided to start testing last year, um, as you see here, uh, I was not a happy camper uh, when these bees arrived and the, uh, um, uh, the supplier, I got the four of the species from one supplier and one another from another supplier. And um, uh, um, as you imagine, uh, uh, you know, paying 120 bucks for these, I, I was not a happy person. So right now, I, I have no carnolians left whatsoever. And uh, it did save me time out in the field. There was less beehives you had to take care of, but that was not what I wanted to do. The Minnesota Hygienics, um, what actually happened here, we put off four packages together in one location, and within uh, within days, they started to migrate back to one hive, which uh, gave me the impression that this person just took a, a Minnesota Hygienic or a group of bees from a hive and put them in packages, and then uh, they all started to say, hey, my sisters are over there. I'm going to go over there and live. Um, so um, uh, I did have two hives still left. Uh, they're still doing pretty strong. And there are some beetles in, in, in there. We'll go into beetle count in a little while. The buckfast, same thing happened again. You know, um, some of these species people get, and they call it um, a buckfast, is really maybe a hybrid, not really the true buckfast. So the um, hives never really do, did well. The, uh, uh, it was, uh, and of course, they did not survive that winter. And they did have a low beetle count. Uh, the Russians, um, again, I got this from a different supplier, and one hive died out really early. The other hive, I have no clue why it left. Um, um, it, it, you know, it was totally empty. Then one hive had less than a frame and a half of bees, and then two hives are doing well, and they all had low beetle count. Yeah, but by September, I couldn't find any. And that's probably because the Russians are a little bit more aggressive. In one hive, uh, one nuke I was having this year, I uh, opened it up and I noticed that uh, uh, all the bees were clustered in the far corner. And this particular um, nuke has a double screen in it. And I opened up and I looked inside and all these bees were in this corner trying to get to about 10 to 12 small hive beetles that were caught in between the two screens. So they were definitely showing a trait that they wanted to get to those beetles and get rid of them. So um, the small thing, a bad thing about this is that it was just a nuke that started from a swarm. And they didn't really have a high uh, a, uh, bee count, so they didn't really make it. But I would have loved to have had that queen producing more because that could have had a characteristic trait that we were looking for. If they're showing aggressiveness towards that beetle, that would have been great, but it never panned out. 
Uh, at, as far as the, uh, the, the locations, uh, Dave locations, the one Russian Hive had Beatles first, and I think this was because they were doing so well. I noticed that when I took off the, the reducer, it left a larger opening. That's something we're going to uh, discuss a little bit more in detail. And then also I found out later uh, that there was um, hives uh, that were within about two mile, two mile ra uh, radius range where they had over 200 uh, hive beetles in their hives. You know, the, roughly they... So, you know, I was asked how far do they fly. I don't know. Um, you know, could this be an indication? Maybe, maybe not. But if they go from garden to garden, uh, it's hard to tell. Do they, can they fly, um, once they get in the wind, is, does it push them somewhere? Uh, how can you really come up with a test that isn't closely responsible? If you guys don't have small high beetles and I come to your location, I mark them with a little dye, set them out, and then you guys report back to me, you got small high beetles, I don't think that would be a good little test. You know, it's like spreading a disease around. So I don't know how you can really test it. Crest Farm locations, the Minnesota Hygienic was doing good. But then uh, there were hives there two years previously that had, that had problems. And I think what happened that the small high beetles that left the hive ended up going into the local gardens. They had like a, a vegetable garden that they would have. Um, the Russians always had a low count, and, and, uh, and again, I think that's because they were a little bit more aggressive bee. Trapping agents. Okay, we decided to, you know, to see which trapping agents did the best. We did this. This is a picture of a small high beetle on the glue on my kitchen counter. And you can see how his feet is kind of sticking to the glue. And uh, he would get st stuck on the ankles and the f and his tip of his, uh, his claws. But y everybody's seen those um, fly traps that you pull out and they're real sticky and you really get them on your hands. You almost have to use turpentine or uh, stuff to get your fingers off. I said, that's what's going to slow these babies down. I laid that on the t counter put a small high beetle on it, he walked across that like he was crossing a four-lane highway. He it didn't even really slow him down. So that, then I decided I need to test more. Um, and again, here's the, uh, that beetle. He, he's, as he walks, he kind of like picks up his feet and kind of like uh, jerks it off and sets it down, just like we would walk if we were in mud up to our ankles or our knees. We kind of like jerk and get stuck and we uh, keep moving. Some of the uh, traps slowed them down, but none of them actually t have stopped them yet, totally. Oops. Okay. So uh, also tested, you know, we took a bunch of these little containers like this, and we filled them up with water and saline solution and oil. How long does it take a beetle to drown? Well, anywhere from one to 10 minutes. And I noticed that the difference in time was really more like, uh, might have been related to temperature because we did it in the spring and they took a longer time to drown. When we did it in the fall, it was within minutes. It was almost like you put a person who doesn't know how to swim in the water and at first they might be relaxed, but then they, get, they start to get real panicky. And you can see them quiver and, uh, and then eventually just drown because it, it, it's, it's actually suffocating them. Um, then, and, and I think it's like I said, it was probably just because of the, uh, the temperature difference between the, uh, the water we were testing in the spring and the water and the uh, temperature outside in the fall. The sandwich containers and the corrugated plastics we decided to postpone until we came up with some kind of glue that we're looking for. And of course, we use the screen bottom board and uh, with oil, and that that does really uh, work. Okay, quickly, something I need to cover is this: uh, when you have a budget for a SARE grant, you have to keep track of that money. They like to know what you're spending it on. So, in the original proposal, I was going to use galvanized pipe because that's what I used in my first two hives, but then I went to replace it by uh, four by four lumber. So. I saved them $1,126, and I hope that made them happy. Uh, so overall, like in this one case down here, 
with corrugated plastic. I was going to buy the sheets. I went to a, a sign manufacturer, told him what I wanted to do, and he said, hey, here's my junk pile, and he just gave me all I wanted, so I got that for free. Uh, then, um, then little things like I had the roofing paper. I already had that on hand, so I didn't have to buy that. And the tub of grease, the local uh, farm store was having a sell on grease, so I got a bucket of that and saved it. So uh, you can come up with the original budget, but then you can actually save, you know, save Sarah that money and you don't have to uh, uh, you know, spend it all. So basically, that was the end of the 2011 testing thing. Uh, we came up to um, when we actually, at the very end, we, um, I always use the word we, uh, I and the Beatles, um, I put them in this salt solution. I needed to see, is it really blocking the larvae from developing? Is it, are they still able to get through? So I had a cordon off and I put, you know, maybe two dozen, three dozen larvae on there. And um, I said, okay, let's watch you die. Um, I, could, I couldn't really see that, but I was able to dig through and find five dead carcasses, which not is a good result. So I said, okay, we're going to step back. How can I come up with a test that I can for sure determine if the larvae is getting through it or not? So I look at that, my little bee stand, uh, my test stand, uh, box. I said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to elevate it. I'm going to elevate that up over some tin pan, and I'm going to put this wire mesh in so the rock doesn't fall through, but it's still small enough, to, large enough to let the beetles uh, get through. So that's where I left off in 2011. And as a beekeeper, you can't really do much in January and February and March. Uh, um, so and even if I try to find beetles, I wouldn't have been able to find them. It wouldn't be in a valid test because they're normally not out there in the wintertime. So that, that was pretty at, at the end of 2011. I was kind of discouraged, but also found some new ways to uh, go down a new path. That's why I call path to discovery. Once you ended up going one direction, you say, well, I think I'm going to go this way now. How can I prove it or disprove my theory? So I said, I'm going to start off with some new bees, and I'm going to medicate them and powder sugar test to see if there's any pests uh, or diseases coming along with them. And I'm going to keep them in the uh, box inside the hive three to five days, just for the medication purposes. And I asked four volunteers in my local bee club, would they like to be uh, test sites? All they had to do was let me come in with my little bee stand, put it up. I'll stay out of the way. I will never visit you again until the end of the year. You keep track of the information for me. I didn't want to have any bias directly or indirectly uh, on their observations. And we also said I'm going to go out and test new glue products. So when I went out to a lot of, um, come on glue, when I went out shopping all winter long and I'd go to Chicago or Kansas City or wherever I was at visiting people, I'd go to their section they had glue. And um, like, for an example, this uh, flea trap I got from Chicago. That flea trap, um, you can't, I, didn't, I never found it in St. Louis. Um, I also got on the web, and the website said uh, you had these little traps that is inhumane to mice. And I said, well, if they hold a mouse, maybe they will hold a small hive beetle. And well, that's not true, because in the process of trying to test some of these glue products, it's almost like they were... The, uh, lay, like a uh, water bug, it doesn't break that last elasticity of that glue surface. So they were walking across some of this stuff like, the, you know, it was a day in the park. You know, they had, it was nothing was slowing them down. And of course, we asked that question, can we control or eliminate small high beetles by non-chemical processes in 2012? Because I said, I didn't do it in 2011, will I be able to do it now? And that, I have to say, was a good year. My son also got married that year, too. But um, I started off where I left off at, and again, started off with that hive. It was elevated off the ground, filled it up, whoop, got to back up, filled it up with P-Rock, cordoned it off, 
And I said, okay, now I have to go out and get some small hive beetles. I went out to my weakest hive. I put in some pollen patty. I waited for a couple of weeks, and I got all the small hive beetles I wanted. I put these little beetles in a container like this, went out, and on my first test, I put about 75, 75 of these small hive beetles in this rocky surface in the, in the different coordinates. Within about 15 minutes, as I was sitting there, there's my little chair, I would sit out there, my uh, little timer, and uh, it got boring after a while, but within 15 minutes, you could sit there, you can actually hear, I was sitting there, and I was reading the book, and I heard this ping. I looked down, and there's a, there's a larvae on the ground, and I go, ah, shoot. Then a, a little while later, ping. Then I noticed uh, that they were falling out around the perimeter of the wood, right along the edges. And when I would pick them up and put them back in the middle, they wouldn't do it. So then for the next two hours, I was out there. And it went by kind of fast, the first two hours, and none of them made it through. And then I went inside, 10-minute ten, ten break, came back out for another 45 minutes, nothing. Looking to trade, there was nothing. And so I was pretty you know, confident by that point, none of them after that point were making it th uh, uh, through the uh, rock. So then I said, okay, let's do it with the salt. I did it with the salt. These little larvae, as soon as they get there, they're trying to find a, a, a way to get into the, into the ground. These little critters couldn't do that. So uh, I, again, I started off with like 73 of them. They ended up getting out. About four of them got out because they would go across the rocky salt, go to the edge of the board, climb up the board, over the board, and then down onto the, onto the, uh, uh, the tin pan. And they did move kind of fast, so I just picked them up, and once I put them in the middle, and once they found that first spot that they think they can get down, they kept on going down. Then I remembered, when you could watch the larvae of a, a wax moth in a hive, they can go backwards and forward. These little critters can only go forward. So that kind of gave a little thing in my head, I, and I said, can adult beetles go forward and backwards. So I kept that in my head for a while for uh, something I wanted to test. So then I said, okay. I said, what do I know about? I know as soon as they get in the dirt, they want to go down. How can I make these creatures go down? So I ended up putting some dirt on top of that salt. I put the larvae, I started off with 80 of them, put them in, you know, about 10 or 12 in each section. And I had my camera off to the side, I sprinkled them down with a spoon, counted them as I went, picked up my camera to take a picture. They were already gone. They were already in that soil. So I just said, I need to look at that a little closer. So that's when I decided to go in my house, and I had these little containers. And I said, what I'm going to do is put in these containers, like in this one, was this dirt on the left, and the one on, uh, on the right was the sand. I wanted to see how can they do with sand. In sand, they can't get through sand. The granules of sand are too compact. So you can see on the bottom here, like uh, th these, these beetles, there's three of them in here, and one up, up here. They kept on going in circles, around and around. And about seven days, it was five to seven days, they both died. Here in the dirt, put them in the dirt, it was like they were gone, they were in the dirt. So then I decided, what if I just took the dirt and salt? I wanted to see what happens here. So what happened is that they went through the dirt, and let's see, I gotta take my glasses off for this. Yes, you can still see uh, right as they entered into the salt, so you can pass this around later, that the small high beetle, as soon as he got through the dirt, got into the salt, and he couldn't go any further, and he actually died right there in the salt. So I said, okay, I think I'm kind of happy with this result because none of them made it through. Zero. All 80 never made it through the comp couldn't even make it through. And that's what I was looking for. I wanted a way that says that this will totally stop them. 
they will not do it. So somebody was asking me how fast they traveled. So something I did last year, uh, by accident, I spilled a jar full of small high beetles, adults and larvae, onto the top of an oil drum, a uh, 55-gallon drum. And uh, within seconds, they died. It was about 95 degrees outside. Barrel was t hot to the touch, almost like to your car. So um, I got one of those little temperature things. You kind of shoot at the temperature thing, and you wanted to see the surface of the temperature of the stuff. And of course, as soon as you get it, it's a new toy. So I went out and I checked trees, cars, side of my house. Found out the trees are actually quite consistent. They were like 82 degrees with the sun even hitting on the side. And, and I said, well, I wonder whether they're on the dark side. But I never did it. You know, I, I had to get back to stop playing. So I, I did this. Uh, in, I kept testing. And I started early in the morning. It was about 75 degrees outside. Surface temperature was uh, pretty cool, about 76, 78. The sun wasn't really up that high in the sky yet. But I'm going to ask a question, and maybe only one person will know this answer. But how long does it take a small hive beetle to travel 12 inches? The person who gets closer, I'll put his name in a hat for maybe a drawing for a car. <laughs> so how long do you think it would take? Three minutes, how did you know that? You guess. It just took under three minutes. Like, on the average, I did this with five of them. It was like two, point, uh, two minutes and 50 some odd seconds, 52 seconds. And um, so people were saying, well, you put a small high beetle in concrete, he will go for miles until he will find a suitable soil, providing he doesn't die on the way, OK? Well, when they started to die, I was trying to get temperatures. When I did the number six and number seven test, that's when they started to die. They started to die roughly about 125 to 158 degrees. But I think the reason why I was getting that differences is like in this picture, the concrete is pitted. You know, you don't, it's not, we think it's really smooth, but it's really not. So I was trying to get that temperature and it, it will vary within, you know, I guess quarter of an inch or sixteenth of an inch. The temperature is just on the concrete would just vary. But once it got up to that temperature, this little critter would die. Now, in an adult, he will fly off and go somewhere else. So if the next time you're on a game show and they ask you how long it takes a small hive beetle to travel, you will have that answer, and it's been proven, okay? So that led me to something else. I wanted to know, if I took a small hive beetle, could I make him walk? Does he walk backwards? So I decided I, I need a straw. So I w decided I'm going to go out and get a straw. I went out to a bunch of these gift shops, and they were just too big. So I went into a Target, walking down an aisle, and I found these uh, fruit drinks. And I saw the straw, and I said, that's what I want. That's it. So whenever you're out, your brain is always thinking about how you can do things, the science brain. So I took that straw, and I, I taped them together. And I got this beetle, you know, took one out of the, the container, and I actually got him in there, and he actually walked the entire length of that straw. And I'm going, good, I like this so far. What is he going to do when he hits my finger? I had my finger in the way. He came up, and he kind of just bumped my finger, and he started walking backwards. And I go, oh, I didn't want you to do that. But when he walked backwards, he was almost like walking with a moonwalk, because his joints are not made that same, so he was kind of like doing a little Michael Jackson on the, on the reverse. And so I said, ah, huh, that could still be beneficial. If I can get that glue in these small containers and get him to go forward, and he's, his mind is to go forward for some reason, he's going to get further into the straw. Sure, he's going to get over the glue, but then can he back out as well as he got in? One thing I did with a small high beetle, I wanted to see if I got the glue on his back, what would happen. I took a beetle, I put it on the glue, that flea trap glue, that's the best one that we found that worked, and that beetle would lay there like a turtle, just trying to flip itself over. Eventually, it took its one leg, hit the glue, flipped itself over, got up and started to walk off. And I said, huh, okay. I grabbed that beetle, put it back. 
Well, I want to see, again, how long does it take? If it takes a certain amount of time, that could be beneficial. I put that beetle back on its back. First time, it took like five to seven minutes before they flipped themselves over. This, it took about maybe 30 seconds. Took that leg, flipped it over, walked right off. And I said, huh, does this beetle learn? Can he really learn? So I said, I'm going to do it again. As soon as I flipped that beetle on its back, it took its leg, flipped it on the glue, started walking off. And I go, ah, I should have kept going because now this is beady. Uh, uh, does the beetle really learn? Have learned for transfer, meaning that could I take that beetle, I should have maybe tried it, clipped off that leg, put him on his back again, and say, now the beetle says, well, I don't have a leg there now. I have one on my other side. I'll flip that and get going. Then we could say the beetle ha has an ability to learn, okay? But we didn't do that study. You know, I was, I, it would been, might have been fun. So what I ended up doing is I took, I wanted to find out, okay, if these critters like to go in these cracks and crevices, what's making them go up it? So I have like a banana oil in one of them on the upper left. Uh, I have uh, bananas, pear, and uh, uh, pollen patties in this one. I then decided I would, you know, I put them in this container to see how they would work. And these are actually the beetles I just recently uh, uh, got from a, uh, the, the guy that said that they were all dead from the, being cold. Oop. This is the guy that I got the beetles from. This is one of the test sites. As you see, he started off with small counts, but in June, well, in July, his beetle count really got up high. This is the guy that had the hives within two miles of where I had my first, my, uh, uh, first test hives. Uh, he bought these hives from a, uh, another beekeeper. Uh, this is his uh, second year of beekeeping, uh, uh, first full year. And when I went back to visit him this year to pick up uh, the report, um, he told me two of his hives died from wax moths, and and he didn't know what to do with them, so he just put the uh, the, the dead out the dead out hives in the apiary and let all the other bees, you know, go to those hives and you know clean out the hives for them. I said, well, that's not the way you want to do it if you have diseases in your hive. Uh, so uh, talk to him about it. What he was doing. Right in June and July, he was harvesting honey right at that time. Uh, he has the old-fashioned uh, beehives where they just had the, uh, the boards on the bottom. Uh, he originally had these hives sitting on really nice farmland, really loose soil, something that small hive beetles would like. Um, next year, I would like to see these numbers come down. Um, so next year, although this study is over with, we're still going to go out there and want to see if if his numbers have decreased. The other test site, uh, uh, this is Debbie and Sandy's test site. Uh, they had started off with two hives. Uh, they, they decided to split and make two uh, hives, requeen them. In April, the, uh, the new hives, uh, they were probably the weakest hive and they got some beetles. And then uh, the other hives, uh, the strong and the testy hive, uh, didn't have any. And I, uh, you can see that their counts were always low. And in June, July, August, September, October, being housewives, they decided they had uh, uh, enough of that to do. And um, it, it, they, they had honey. Uh, the only problem is that they had honey all summer. And they are, again, new beekeepers. And they did not know they did not need to feed the bees all summer long because their honey was really light in color. And people thought that was kind of strange. And it was because the honey they were eating was from the sugar water they've been feeding them all summer. So uh, uh, I don't know if that had anything to do with the beetles or not, but that's what they were doing. So now they won't do it next year. The weakness. What is weakness about this whole system? Well, you still got the larvae. The larvae is still coming in your hive. The larvae is still eating your, uh, uh, your hive, your, your pupa, uh, um, the... Uh, they're eating the, um, the wax, they're eating the, uh, the pollen, they're destroying your hive. Then they go into the ground. 
you still got adults. You got adult bees coming in, uh, adult uh, larvae, adult uh, small eye beetle coming in from different people. You know, how can we control that? And of course, if you have, if you, you have 30,000 hives and you're gonna be transporting them, you don't wanna carry salt, rock, and dirt, which everywhere you wanna go, all right? And the beehive stand itself, it's two feet high off the ground. The, uh, the fourth test site, Bill, he was an older gentleman and uh, he did not like it, it was too tall. So, and, but he was also had this habit of that he always wants to keep stacking his supers to see how many supers he can get on. I, as soon as that super is ready to take off, I take it off. I, I don't want to see how, many, how high I go. He did say the hives that were over this bee stand uh, had a lot less bee, uh, bee, uh, hive beetles. He, he really couldn't say how many he counted, but he couldn't really see them when he opened up. His, his other hives he had off to the side that were virtually on the ground on cinder blocks, he would open them up and he could actually see the, 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 the hive beetles run around. Um, um, maybe it had something to do with it, maybe not, I don't know. We, we we're not trying to test. So, could I make a guarantee? I, people say you shouldn't make a guarantee, but uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yes, I can guarantee that you can kill every larvae in your, that falls out of your hive into uh, this little beetle box, we just call it. If you took, right along, if this was a piece of plywood, pressure-treated plywood, two by six, line that with roofing paper, put a rock salt mixture inside here, with a little layer of dirt across the top, making sure this hive is within the boundaries of that location. So when those, when those little larvae fall out late at night, when it's cool out, they're not gonna do this at 10 o'clock in the morning, okay? So when they drop out, they will come down. And as soon as they hit that dirt, they're gonna start to go straight down. Now, if you didn't have this dirt on here, and let's say that was rock salt right there. I'd be afraid that that beetle larvae would hit that, crawl, get up, over, and then get out. But by having that dirt in there, it's, it, they have that instinct. As soon as they hit that dirt, they're going down. And they would just keep on down into that rock salt solution. Eventually, when it rains, that's going to get uh, like a, a salty ocean, uh, ocean for them, and they won't get in. So you just build this, maybe, maybe you don't have to go two feet. Maybe you can go 12 inches. When I go two feet, 24 inches, I don't have a problem with raccoons, mice, or any of those other critters. Also, right along the legs here, we ended up putting tangle foot glue on to try to keep roaches and ants out. Uh, last year, before putting that on, I would have a, you know, half a dozen roaches in each box. This year, out of 20 hives, I've only found one roach out of 20 hives. No ants, okay? So maybe, you know, the ants would come across here, come up here, and also die. You know, maybe, I don't know, I didn't count ants. I wasn't concerned about them. So I, I would probably have to say, I would guarantee that if you build your hive body boxes over some kind of platform, that would prevent that larvae from getting to the natural ground into this solution area down there, every larvae is going to die. How does that help? Well, thinking about Einstein kind of thinking, if you did not let any child ever develop to become an adult, what will eventually happen to that society? It would die off. Now, problem with this too. Let's say that I do it, my neighbor doesn't. He still likes to raise small high beetles. Nothing you can do about it, okay? So that's why we said, you know, I went to the next level after that, up and beyond, and said, what can I really do? Oop. So here's a picture of my three hives in those boxes with the, the stands. These, uh, these two by sixes here are keeping the hive sturdy on that platform. You can see a little queen cage here I requeen. I was going to talk about the um, uh, reducer. The hives that were doing the best 
we took the reducer off. When we took that reducer off, we found small hive beetles in that hive before we found in a hive that did not have the reducer off. In my one Minnesota hygienic, covered in front with hives. But at nighttime, you know, maybe they're taking too much of a break. Maybe they're letting those little cracks and crevices come in. I also started to duct tape around the openings where the hive body boxes didn't really fit close together. That might have helped reduce some of the uh, roach problem too. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But those small hive beetles, if they can find a way in, they're gonna get in, okay? So if, if, the, if, the, if the bees are living in a tree, they don't have that problem. They're living in our artificial boxes, we might just be adding to the problem by not really closing them off. Some upcoming products. This is something I was trying to work on. It's actually a trap uh, where you would have glue on all four surfaces and you would eject some kind of pheromone in the middle. This, uh, the beetle would then crawl into the pheromone and get stuck. Um, that's the premise. That's what we're trying to work on. Uh, a thing about this kind of trap, you don't have to have it in your beehive. You could probably stick it on the side of your trap. You could probably stick it, stick it on a tree next to your hive, just like all these other pheromone traps they have out in the industry. I gotta see if I can stretch that leg out. Oh, I was down long. One moment. Oh, gotta get back to the gym. Um, so in this, you could actually go out there and stick it to the outside, so you don't have to have the beetles get in your hive. A lot of the traps that I've seen inside, beetle, in, inside the hive, the, sure, they fall in, they get attracted. But what attract them to the hive in the first place is not that trap, but the hive itself. They're in there, they get into your hive, they're already laying eggs, and they will f eventually fall into a trap. There's two gentlemen on the web talking about two products, and they were, uh, somebody was talking back and forth uh, uh, on them, and one said, well, my beetle, uh, high, my one beetle trap call, uh, caught 50 beetles, yours only caught five. Well, maybe you only had five in that hive, and you might have 2,000 in this hive. You know? No, you know, the numbers, where are the numbers? You know, I like to see the numbers. So, um, then uh, another thing is uh, some, something I'm trying to get manufactured this year is called a, uh, a pollen feeder. And this came from my idea, okay, if I want small high beetles, I guess I can get a pollen patty and put it in and get the beetles. This one actually dry pollen and you set it on the outside of your hive and the bees will go into it. It's almost like a Boardman feeder. Then the University of Florida has this patent. They actually patented it last year. It sits on the bottom of your hive, uh, almost at the same spot where your, uh, your uh, bottom board would fit and, or your, uh, uh, your screen bottom board. And the, uh, it gets the piece on the bottom gets inverted, sits on top, and they put some pheromones in it, and then you start stacking your hive bodies up. Again, this is the premise that the, the beetles will go down through your hive, go down, get caught, and get killed in here. Um, I haven't seen it on the market anywhere, but uh, they got that patent, the University of Florida. You do have problems with deer when you feed uh, salt out there, okay? I really don't consider it a problem, but these deer are still living around my house. I saw them in my garden uh, two days ago eating on something that I didn't care. You know, they, they were fine. By this time of the year, they can have whatever they want. Um, but um, I guess that's about it as, as far as I can remember. Probably if you ask me a question, I would probably remember something I forgot. So first question, yes. Um, let me make sure I understand this. They lay the eggs, the eggs go back down into the ground, and they have to come back up. No, the eggs, laid, the eggs are laid in the hive. They are hatched in the hive. They, the larvae then goes around eating everything in the hive. The larvae then falls down to the ground, gets through the ground, pupates as an adult, and comes back out, and within seven days, supposed to start laying eggs. Okay. Can the larvae swim? No. Then why not just put your beehive in a moat? Well, you could, everybody, I guess, if you want, you could do that. Uh, people have put them in a, a tub of water, you know, one of those uh, round circular uh, kids' tub. 
uh, and uh, uh, if if that's the thing they think they want to do, but you can. Yes, because they can't get through. Now, I guess you, as long as the beetles are falling in there, the thing is, I found that some beetles uh, swim lasted anywhere from a, a one to ten minutes. Uh, now, the thing is, was that one to ten minute span based on the temperature differences or the age of the larvae or the age of the beetle as it fell into the water. Like some of them fell into the water and within a minute they died. Some of them fell in the water and it wasn't until about 10 minutes later that they actually drowned. I don't know, was, it, was there a little bit more positive buoyancy? You know, like when people go swimming, people are a little bit more buoyant than others. Uh, but if that method works, uh, uh, Yes. Yes, if it falls in walls, water, stays in the water and drowns, you're doing the same thing. Yep. The only, uh, but you know, put yourself on the other side of that and ask yourself questions uh, about the water. How long will the water be there? Uh, could there be mosquito problems? Could, it get, uh, could there be other problems? How often in dry spells do you have to put water in? You know, uh, just like there's weaknesses and strengths in, in this approach. My life's at my home, so I check the water every day. Easy accessible ability. But uh, like I got uh, 15 hives in a remote site. So uh, when you have like the, the hives around my house, I could, it's easier to maintain than hives that are like a 10 to 15 minute drive away. Um, uh, uh, this method... Uh, we wanted to come up with something that, uh, you know, said, well, you leave it there, you put it there, you don't have to worry about it. Okay, question. Come on. Do I know any jokes? No, I don't. Do I sing and dance? If I have to. Next person that asks a question will get a free hamburger. All right. <laughs> What's Are, are you running screen bottom boards? Yes, that's, thank you. That's what I wanted to remember. I, they work if you do it correctly, okay? They will help control your bug problem. Put your hive, make sure it's level. Put a little oil in it, a little vegetable oil. Uh, I leave it in there all year. Yeah, at the end of the year, I, uh, I go out, pull them out, clean them out, put more in. When I go out to my hives every, every time, I bring along a garbage uh, uh, bags uh, so that whatever garbage I get from the hive, I put it in a bag, I take it home, I treat it, and then I get rid of it. I try to keep that site as clean as possible. Those small bo uh, those hive bo uh, the bottom boards, put the oil in, the larvae will fall down on that and kill it. Okay, does it get all of them? I don't think so, because as they come down along the front or the back, you might come out of it. Also, I found out that in the back, I have to duct tape the back uh, where that, that screen and that bottom board slides in because that opening's big enough that I've seen roaches and other insects get in there. So if they can get in there, the small hive beetle get in there. So I just go out and get the, get the duct tape. Now they're coming out with all those multicolored duct tapes. I guess you can really dress up your hives really fancy if you wanted to. I personally stick, stick with the gray. You know, the, the cheap and they don't know the difference. All right. What do you want on that hamburger? <laughs> okay, All right. Questions, concerns, comments, recommendations. Who here have problems with small hive beetles? Uh, who here are beekeepers? What part of the country are you from? Johnson County, Missouri. Yeah, okay. Where's the, that's north of here? Uh, west. West? Do you have... Do you have any problems with other uh, insects? Uh, wax moths. Wax moths? Yeah. yeah, we were looking in the wax moths have come up with a trap. That's what that one uh, thing from uh, University of Galveston, uh, Florida. Uh, it's actually how to get wax moths. But uh, have you ever gone out to your hives at night with a flashlight to see how many wax moths you have on the outside? Try that. You can actually uh, go out there and you can see them uh, trying to get into the hive at night. You put the flashlight on them, they will stay there for a few seconds and then leave but you can do a pretty good count that way. Uh, what part of the state are you from? Just north of here, about 35 miles. 
Oh, so you, you had breakfast at home this morning. Okay. What did you have for breakfast? Good. Uh, uh, any problem with any bugs or insects? No, I haven't seen trouble with wax moths. Wax moths? When did you first notice you had wax moths? What month? It's fairly early in the year. Early? Do you have a lot of them? Not, or, a, great, not a great lot. Either. What do you do once you see them? What are you doing? Still trying to figure it out? Yeah, what I ended up doing when I found them, I actually want to take them three minutes. When I ended up, I actually would take them and I was trying to raise them. And I was raising wax moths again in my kitchen with my wife's permission. She said, as long as I clean up and be accountable for every insect, she doesn't care. So um, I, I was started to uh, notice that uh, some of the studies they did with wax moths is that they had this pheromone trap they put in at the end of this uh, uh, like greenhouse, and they were hoping to capture these wax moths to, uh, to, to attract them. And uh, it, didn't, it wasn't promising. They, out of 100 they released, they caught like three or four. But the, the key is the wax moth uh, will come out at night, mate, and they make this clicking noise at the same time they give out the pheromone. So um, what I w wanted to do this year was actually, I'm saving all my queen boxes, cages, and I'm going to uh, take the, uh, the wax moth, uh, the male wax moth, and put them in this queen cage. And then I'm going to take that queen cage and stick it inside that Galveston pipe, make a bigger hole at the top, and see if I can attract those wax moths that way to see if I can do something. If I can do that and then line it with some kind of glue product, then hopefully the wax moths will be attracted. I, had, I have talked to a company in, uh, uh, in um, Canada about this beetle trap and about the wax moths, and they're trying to come up with a, a thing to do that too. So um, uh, they got the tens of, tens of thousands of dollars. I only got like six or seven, so uh, it's going to be kind of hard for me to do anything. Um, how high off the ground do you have your hives? 16 inches. 16 inches? Do you have any other problems with ants and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm having some. Do you, uh, uh, I use Tanglefoot a product, glue, and I just put around the base, and that really stops them or slows them down. You, uh, you might also might have to treat the ground. Uh, you know, I hate using chemical, but you might have to treat the ground around it to try to keep the ant population down. Another thing people have done, they would find these ant holes, and they would end up taking, I think it's cornmeal or corn flour, and they would sprinkle it around the, the ant hole, and the ants would take this, take it down, and to try to feed it to their young, and uh, it would expand in their stomach and kill them. So that seems to, have, to help. Another thing. Well, that's it. I'm done. It's been nice talking to you people. Thanks for showing up on an early Saturday morning with the temperature in their, what, 40s? It was cold. Bye-bye.